her uh, next vegetable garden. Okay, then there was a very good question uh, about uh, fertilizers. And that was, uh, what do you do if you don't, if you're using a material for your fertilizer that doesn't come in a box and therefore, or a bag, and therefore doesn't have information about how much to use? Or maybe it's a material like alfalfa pellets that isn't being sold as a fertilizer, but you're going to use it as a fertilizer. So that's an excellent question. So I just wanna repeat that if it does come in a box or a bag and there are instructions on it, that you should always follow the instructions on the package. Uh, they are designed for success. So you definitely wanna do that. The, uh, there was a question about what a complete fertilizer is. And so I'm just gonna point out if you can see my little arrow here, these three numbers on this fertilizer package are uh, if they're not zero, that's called a complete fertilizer, meaning it has the something of the three primary nutrients needed by plants, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in that order. The only one that we are concerned with here, if you are growing in Santa Clara County clay, is the first one because the other two are plentiful in our clay soil. So nitrogen is the only thing that we worry about. Okay, now what, going to that question, that good question, how much do you use if you don't have a bag that's telling you how much to use it? I am going to give you one example and you're gonna use this as sort of a template for whatever you use. So I mentioned alfalfa pellets last time as being the thing that I use mainly in my garden. So if you wanna figure out how much alfalfa, how much fertilizer you need, you need to first know how much um, how much that you you need to know an amount of nitrogen per square yard in your garden that you should be using. And I'm going to tell you that as a rule of thumb, you want to use about 0.02 pounds of actual nitrogen per square yard. To those of you that are scientists and uh, happy mathematician, uh, uh, mathematicians, I am going to apologize for um, using not using the metric system. I'm sorry about that. Sorry about skipping that slide. Um, but I just find that it's easier for most of my audiences if I keep this in pounds and square yards. So that's why I've done that. So 0.02 pounds per, of nitrogen per square yard. Alfalfa, as you see in the lower half of the slide, is about 2.5% nitrogen or about 2% nitrogen. So that means it's 0.025 pounds of nitrogen per pound of alfalfa. So if you need 0.020 pounds of nitrogen, you need about a pound of alfalfa per square yard. I think most of us can easily look at our garden beds and estimate, okay, here's, there's about a square yard here, a square yard here, a square yard over here. And I find this is a pretty easy way for gardeners to come up with a number. Uh, so if you had a four by eight bed, it would be 32 square feet. That would be a little over, be about three and a half square yards. And so you would need about eight, nine, um, uh, it, it, you would need about three and a half pounds of alfalfa. I hope that makes sense. Now, if you aren't using alfalfa, if you're using one of these other plant material, these are, these are materials that you might be getting your hands on that aren't in a labeled fertilizer bag. Actually, I think blood meal would be in a, in a labeled bag. I think feather meal would, fish meal. But many of you said that you were using chicken, uh, you were using manure. And so I put in red in this table, chicken manure and steer manure. There are still issues with trying to tell you what the percent of nitrogen is. Chicken manure, if it's dry, is about 4% nitrogen. Um, how dry is dry? <laughs> if you're getting your chicken manure from your neighbor, it may not be dry. It may be mixed with bedding. So it's very, difficult to be sure about the nitrogen content of a natural material like this. Steer manure you can see is lower, it's about 1.5% nitrogen. 
Um, so you're going to have to estimate um, how many pounds of this kind of material you need if you're, if you're using a material that you're just getting from, from a friend or from a farmer. And, uh, but you can use these numbers as a guide. If it's dry chicken manure, about 4% nitrogen, wet, about 1.5, steer manure, about 1.5. I can just, I, yes. Can I can I break in? This is Sharon. Sure. So uh, I've got a couple of follow up questions mm -hmm. on the alfalfa. So, um, how many cups of alfalfa pellets? Okay, I, I it's about a quart, but I highly recommend you do what I did when I started using alfalfa about twenty years ago or twenty five years ago. I actually brought alfalfa in and weighed it on my kitchen scale, yeah. and found a container that I knew when it was full was about a pound of alfalfa. So and I suggest that you do that, but it is about a quart. Yeah, and then the, a pound of alfalfa, how often? And do alfalfa pellets attract rats? No, alfalfa pellets do not attract rats in my yard. Uh, for one thing, you're mixing them into the soil. And if you've got them in a bag somewhere, be sure it's rat proof. I put mine into a, I have a galvanized, uh, huge galvanized bucket that holds 50 pounds of alfalfa with a lid, tight fitting lid, and I keep it in that. So like any other material like that, you do not, dog food, cat food, you do not want to put that where uh, any animal can um, can access it. So- And I'm sorry, and how often do you apply the pound of alfalfa? As we explained last time, you sprinkle this over the bed when you're preparing it and you dig it into the bed and it will last two to three months. So that means it will last about through the, any season. So okay, you thank on. you. And then you do it every single time that you're preparing for a new season. Okay. Great. All right. Thank I you. wish you the best, but I have a, a last resort for you. <laughs> this is what we live for in the Master Gardener program, answering your specific questions. So this is our old uh, help desk uh, cubicle. It's if you ever get to visit us when COVID-19 restrictions are no longer in effect, you can actually walk into the county building um, on Burger Drive and you can come and see the Master Gardener uh, help desk and talk to a Master Gardener in person. But if you have a doubt, if that wasn't enough, if the math made your eyes go around in circles, uh, just write to the help desk. Go to our website, fill out the form, that email will come to our help desk and somebody will answer you. Just tell them what you want to use and ask them how much you should use. And they will be delighted that you asked your question. Mm -hmm. Okay, there were a couple of questions about irrigation and this one is even harder, believe it or not, than the fertilizer to get really specific about it. Fortunately, the joy of the cool season is that usually you're not irrigating. You're not having to worry about it because the rains are taking care of irrigation for you. Because it's cool, the, the water lasts longer in your beds. We don't have the issue of evaporating from the beds because of the heat of summer. So um, that is the good news. But you still have to be vigilant because there are years when we don't have uh, regular rains. And so you are going to possibly have to be using your irrigation. Now, I know that what you would like would be to just get a rule of thumb here. It's not possible. It depends on your soil. It depends on the plants you are growing. It depends on the stage that they are at. Um, it depends on the, your delivery system of water. It depends on your mulch and, uh, and what it's made of and how thick it is. Uh, and it depends on the weather. So it's, and, and on the soil that you've used in your raised bed. If you have a uh, fill, uh, a, a partially uh, potting soil in there, um, it's going to need more water, much more water than if it's a clay soil uh, that's been amended with uh, some, just a smaller amount of compost. So the basics are this, apply whatever water you're applying slowly so it sinks in rather than running off or running down channels drip systems and soaker hoses are the best way to do this. Um, but you can do it by hand if you're patient, it, just do it slowly. Start with the bed moist all the way down and keep it that way. 
don't start with a dry bed because then you'll never know if there's water down there where the roots are trying to get to. And then, and this is the most important, you must monitor your soil moisture. Nobody can tell you that if you run your drip system for half an hour, you'll be fine. Um, I can tell you that if you only run your drip system for five minutes, you will not be fine. <laughs> drip systems have to be run for uh, 20 to 30 to 45 to even longer numbers of minutes because they deliver the water so slowly. But in order to know how much to do it without wasting water, which I know none of us want to do, you must monitor. I remember last time we talked about this, stick a trowel or a hori hori or some similar instrument into the soil all the way up to the hill, pull it aside, look down there at the bottom of that eight inch deep hole and see whether it is moist all the way down that far. Okay. All right, in a good year, as I said, rains are going to take care of most of this for you. And then remember to turn off your irrigation systems if they are automatic. You don't wanna keep adding water if the rains have been doing it for you. Okay, so that's uh, bringing you up to date on irrigation. And then we have, um, uh, I wanted to make one last plea for you to not cram too many plants into your garden to the point where you are crowding them. Remember that plants need sun, they need water and uh, fertilizer and air from the soil where their roots are. And if you put them too close together, they will not get the share that they need. So uh, follow the, the directions that you can find on our website or on seed packets for how far apart to plant your plants. And just to try to convince you that this is really important, this is a picture of a bed at Padgy. Again, it's a, a, an older picture, but this bed still exists there, not with the same plants in it. And we were experimenting with spacing. So here you can see, that we have uh, escarole at four different spacings in this section of the bed. Back here, we had kale, over here we had broccoli, and over here we had beets. And we put them at these different spacings to see what kind of production we could get from them. But what I want you to see is look at this broccoli now about seven weeks later. So it looks like there's a lot of space here but it doesn't look like there's a lot of space after those plants have had a chance to grow. They will grow faster and better if you give them the space that they need. Same with the beets, same with the escarole, you can see the whole bed is filled up, even in the most widely spaced parts. And I also didn't get to mention last time just something about supporting vining crops. So I just wanted to throw that in here. The only crop that you grow in the cool season, usually grow in the cool season that needs support, uh, commonly grown is peas. And uh, because we're all familiar with beans, which twine their whole stem around a pole or uh, whatever you put up for them to climb, um, I wanted to be sure that you were aware that peas don't do that. The peas, uh, you can see the stem of this pea plant running this big thick stem running along here. But what holds the pea up is these wiry little tendrils and they will not wrap around something that's an inch in diameter. They need something thin. This happens to be hog fencing, but you could use wire fencing, concrete reinforcing wire, you could use old um, tomato cages, uh, a number of things, but it has to be thin for those tendrils to be uh, able to grab onto and support themselves. There are very few other cool season, oh, oh, and by the way, even short varieties of peas that are billed as being short, not tall, bush style, they appreciate something to hang on to. Otherwise they end up in a heap twining around each other and it makes them more difficult to manage. So even short ones, you can put prunings in the ground and they will hold on to those. Um, there are a couple of other cool season crops that get very tall like fava beans, um, but they don't technically need support. And if they start to fall over, uh, it's probably because they're planted too close together. Uh, so their, their stems can't get sturdy enough. Uh, in the space they've been given, um, but you can just stick a pole in the ground and tie them to it and uh, they'll be fine. Same with Brussels sprouts, they tend to get quite top heavy. So you can stake them up. 
Okay. If you have been trying to be good and keep up with our time schedule and any of you got your seedlings in before that horrible heat wave, I hope they made it through it. If they didn't, it is not your fault. <laughs> that was epic temperature. Um, and I, I am hoping that um, everybody made it through it okay uh, with some extra watering. This picture though, I wanted to put in here because we didn't show it last time, I don't believe. This is row cover uh, applied over some wire hoops over seedlings. It's a really nice way to do it. You just have to find yourself the wire hoops uh, and then you can lay your row cover over that and it makes it easier for you to harvest or to pick it up and look at your plants rather than laying it right on top of your plants. But it's okay to put them on. And, and uh, for shading them, this is one option. It's also a way of protecting them from frost, which I'm going to talk about later tonight. So uh, remember this picture. Um, this is a good way to protect your plants from frost as well with a heavier weight of row cover. It comes in all different weights and um, you can use a heavier one for frost protection. Okay, uh, that is it for the review. And uh, we're not quite on time, but not too bad. And uh, we're going to start talking about pests now. So Sharon has a poll that she wants, uh, we'd like to have you fill out on what pests you've had the most trouble with in your garden. And Candace, we have that problem again, where in fixing the YouTube live stream, so it didn't get going until late, I now can't launch a poll. Oh, okay. So if Edith can launch it, or Catherine, if you're online and you hear my voice, if one of you sees the poll button and can launch poll number two, we'd appreciate it. In the meantime, though, maybe what I should do is just ask you if you could do what we did before, where you just type the answer yeah. into the chat. They've got it. Yeah. When that poll is up. And Edith, I can't see it, so. It is up, it is up, Sharon. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, this is Edith. It's looking about 56% uh, of people have problems with insect pests, 27% with slugs and snails, 68% with vertebrate pests, and 55% with plant diseases. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, we, we are going to start with the winner, which is the um, vertebrate pests. And uh, that will tell you that um, we are not surprised uh, that we got that. Uh, it's, it's a very um, frustrating uh, problem to have. This is a picture of a squirrel enjoying my chard in a uh, container uh, on my back porch. And he was just uh, not even scared enough to go away when I went out to take his picture. So um, they, they can be uh, particularly bad in the fall when they're uh, um, burying their food, caches, uh, nuts and so forth. Uh, and they do that in your freshly prepared beds with your brand new little seedlings in it, throwing your seedlings all over the place at the time. The same thing happens in the spring when they try to find the nuts that they buried uh, in your beds and uh, dig up your spring planted seedlings. So um, they are a problem um, um, both times, but they will also eat, eat veggies. And so the question is, are they the culprit? Because we're going to go to another vertebrate pest in a minute that is also very uh, hard on the vegetable garden. So how do you know whether it's squirrels that are doing damage uh, it was it squirrels that were eating your tomatoes this summer? Um, uh, is it squirrels that are eating your fruit? Is it squirrels that are eating your um, lettuce? So <clears throat> the first question is, do you see them in your yard? So are they there regularly? <coughs> and is the damage done during the day? Now, uh, in order for you to know that, you're gonna have to do a little detective work of going out at night uh, around dusk and uh, checking out your garden because squirrels will not be active in the, in the night. 
So you would have to go out at dusk and then again early in the morning. And if the damage happened during that time, uh, then it is not squirrels that are causing the damage. And we'll talk about what it probably is next. Uh, the other thing about squirrel damage is it's pretty major and pretty messy. So they're not, you can see this guy just tore a big piece of this leaf off and is sitting there eating it. And he will knock a tomato off your plant or bite it off the plant and run six feet with it and eat it someplace else. Um, so if it's like that, if it's uh, pretty major and a move and the, and the material is moved around, it's um, likely to be a squirrel. Uh, it is against the law to catch and release squirrels elsewhere. So trapping these guys and then uh, you know, have a heart trap and taking them somewhere is actually illegal. We have three kinds of squirrels here and two of them are protected. Uh, so um, the, the, the trapping of squirrels is very difficult because you can't be sure that you have trapped the uh, ones that are the one that is trappable and not one of the ones that is technically illegal. So exclusion from your garden, a plot from your from your garden beds is your best defense. I understand that dogs are also very good for this purpose if you have a terrier, especially. Um, I will show you in a minute a couple of ways to exclude them, but I want to show you some other pests first. This is the guy that does an, an awful lot of damage to our vegetable gardens and our fruits um, and for which squirrels often get blamed. This is because rats are nocturnal, so we don't see them uh, doing the damage. And they're also pretty darn subtle and clever. And they uh, are very intelligent and can get into almost anything um, that we might put up to try to foil them. But if you see that the damage is happening at night, it is much more likely being done by a rat than by a squirrel. Also, rats are very neat in the way they eat things. Uh, so you look, they will come back to the same tomato night after night after night and hollow it out. So it, the, the, the outside of it will still be there and they'll be eating out the insides. They do the same thing with oranges. Um, so uh, there are ways that you can look at the damage uh, with many of our cool season crops uh, like lettuce and spinach, they love spinach and they will eat the center out, the growing heart out of a lettuce plant or, or a spinach plant. Um, but I have had them when I was away on a trip and so the garden was unattended for a long time. I've had them strip uh, two to three foot tall collard plants of all the greenery. So um, clearly I had a lot that year. Uh, it is eaten in place, not removed from the plant usually. So they just sit on the plant, the, the spinach plant or at the lettuce plant and eat it right there. They don't uh, tear it apart and take it elsewhere to eat it. So if you, uh, with those clues, if you think that they might, uh, they might be doing the trouble um, you want to look for areas in your yard where they might be nesting. Overgrown hedges and shrubs are, are popular. Cold compost piles, that is, if you've got a compost pile where you've been stacking up yard waste but it, it wasn't ever hot and or, and or it has gone cold, that is perfect rat nesting area. Wood piles or piles of lumber um, uh, that are on the ground uh, that they can get behind or underneath. Uh, that's another good nesting area. But they can also come to you from your neighbors. Rat control, I'm afraid, is a neighborhood-wide project and it's difficult. You can trap rats, there is no restriction. You can use snap traps. Um, there are ways, I, I'm not going to go into it tonight, I can't demonstrate it. Um, uh, so but there are ways of setting them. You bait the trap and don't set it for a number of nights until you know the rats are taking the bait. And then you set, set it. Uh, remember, they're very wary and they're very smart. And uh, we can refer you, the help desk can refer you to wonderful materials on uh, the uh, UC pest management site that will tell you exactly how to take care of rats. Uh, I would be very surprised if there was a single vegetable gardener in Palo Alto that didn't have rats affecting their vegetable gardens. 
And here is a pest, a vertebrate pest that uh, we all think of as something we really want in our gardens. But there are certain times of the year when these beautiful little critters can be quite annoying. Uh, if you see the way that plant is torn so raggedly and around the veins of the plant and the edges of the leaves, that is very typical bird damage. Uh, if something did that to your sunflowers this summer, I can guarantee you it was finches, most likely a lesser goldfinch, which is very common here. Um, again, people think it might be insects. It's not. It's birds. And they also love nipping off pea um, seedlings when they first come out of the ground or uh, uh, tearing away at lettuce. They love lettuce. More of a problem in the spring than in the fall, but with uh, cool season crops both times. And then with, um, with sunflowers in the, in, the, um, in the summer garden. So some things you could do with, to protect your peas if you're planting them from seed is to put strawberry baskets over them when you've planted them and weight, weight it down with a stone or pin it down with a, with a, a staple, an earth staple. Uh, and that will protect it um, until it's big enough to, um, for the birds not to be after it. They, they like picking off a, a bean leaf or a pea leaf when it's just barely out of the ground. You can cover seeded beds or small seedlings uh, with row cover or even large um, lettuce um, plants with row cover and that will stop birds. Okay, for rats and squirrels, you need something a little more uh, ferocious to keep them out. But this is uh, something that many gardeners are, are, have tried successfully. This is a, a, an elaborate cage built out of PVC pipe and a hardware cloth, the welded wire, half inch fencing. It has to be half inch to keep out rats. Um, it's not the most fun material to work with, but, um, and I'm not gonna go into plans here, but you can see the concept. You can also just fold hardware cloth into boxes or tents or various shapes that fit your garden and just set it, set it over. These are more permanent and easier to work with because you don't constantly get scratched by the raw edges of the hardware cloth. But uh, this is a good way to exclude both rats and squirrels. Be sure it's pinned down to the ground uh, because rats don't need a lot of space and they will, they're willing to dig a little bit, not very much uh, to get under it. So be sure it's tight on the ground. Um, this is sort of an ultimate solution that I see coming up more and more in people's yards uh, to accommodate any height of vegetable, including your tomatoes in the summer. So it's actually a room built out of hardware cloth framed with redwood and built on top of a raised bed. So you can see there, this isn't rocket science, it's just how do I get this to be tight and, so that a rat cannot find a way into it. And um, you know, it, 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 I think more and more of us are thinking about encaging our, our whole garden in order to stop the damage from rats. There are of course uh, uh, other ways to deal with vertebrate pests, but these are the ones that are the most acceptable to, um, to vegetable gardeners. Okay, so let's do some of the others. Slugs and snails are also part of our ecosystem, um, but you can rid your uh, lot of slugs and snails. So the, the best way to do it is to hand pick them when they're out there, which is at night. It's actually fun to go out there at night with a headlamp and a bucket and collect these guys uh, and get them out of your garden. Uh, so when, they, when they're coming out, but you can also find where it is they're hiding during the day. During the day, they're not in your garden. They go someplace cool and moist to rest during the day and they come out again at night. So find those places. You've probably been shocked sometimes to find them under a board that was left lying on the ground or under a, a pot, uh, a potted plant that's elevated a bit from the ground. Um, you may find that there's a whole lot of snails in there, or you might find them that they're crawling up in a tree or behind offset boards on a fence. So find those hiding places 
and eliminate them during the day. And by eliminate them, I don't mean throw them over the fence into the neighbor's yard. Uh, for one thing, they're likely to come back. You have to have the courage of your convictions, as I always tell people, and crush them. Uh, if you really can't bear that, you can put them in a plastic bag and put them in the garbage, but that, that seems kind of uh, excessive. Um, if you want to use a bait, um, the um, best, uh, the, the least uh, toxic baits to use are the ones that have iron phosphate as their active ingredient. There are a number of different brand names you wanna look on the box and find that the active ingredient is iron phosphate. And that's the only pesticide that you want to be in there. When iron phosphate disintegrates, when those pellets disintegrate and it goes into the soil, it simply adds iron and phosphate, both of which are um, plant nutrients to your garden soil. So it is not harmful. Be sure with even more than with fertilizers, be sure when you use any pesticide, and this is a pesticide, even though it's not a, it's, it's toxicity is uh, directed at snails and slugs. Um, be sure you follow the directions on the package. Virtually everyone overuses uh, these kinds of baits. They are, uh, it's about a quarter of a teaspoonful of pellets for a square foot of space. That's hardly anything. And people just shake it out, too much of it. So again, as with any other substance like this, keep it in a safe place, keep it contained. Um, dogs, as we know, are, are uh, pretty indiscriminate about what they will eat. And um, even though it's not very toxic, if they eat enough iron phosphate, it is definitely not going to be good for them. So this is uh, hand picking I, is how I got rid of slugs and snails in my yard. Uh, slugs are a bit harder, I will grant you, they're not as nice to pick up. Um, so that's when you might wanna use one of the baits with iron phosphate. Okay, we're ready to talk about some, a few insect pests. There are very few that are really troublesome in the winter. Um, this one, uh, you've probably see the, seen the butterfly in the upper uh, left picture uh, fluttering around your gardens. It is waiting for you to put out your broccoli, kale, collards, uh, cabbage, etc. It is the imported cabbage worm butterfly. And uh, it lays its eggs, which you see in the lower left, much magnified. It lays eggs on the leaves of those vegetables. And, uh, you know, it's easy to see them in that picture. When, if you turn, it's always on the underneath. If you turn the leaves of your plants over, what you will see is not something that clear, but tiny little yellow whiskers. It looks like a little tiny yellow whisker, cream colored whisker. It is, because it's on a dark green leaf, you will be able to see it, but you do, I mean, think about how small an insect egg must be, that's how small it is, but you can see it with a naked eye. You can train yourself to see it. By far the easiest way to foil this pest is to find a way to keep it off your plants, like row cover um, or the, the uh, hardware cloth cages will keep this butterfly from getting to your plants also. Um, but if you can't do that, or uh, for some reason, you can wipe off the eggs with your finger. It's, there's only going to be a few on there, sometimes a lot, if you haven't done it for a few days. Uh, but they're singly laid, they are not laid in big groups, and you won't even know you've done it. They're so tiny. So I highly recommend hand brushing these eggs into oblivion. If you don't, they will eventually hatch into very tiny caterpillars that you won't be able to see very well at first, and that are also pretty good at hiding along veins and in where the leaf meets the stem and so forth. But eventually they will grow by eating your leaves, as you, uh, the leaves of your plant, as you see in the upper right, those big holes that have been chewed out of the size of that, side of that broccoli leaf. Uh, and there's the culprit right there. And they also eat leaves, not just on the edge. Um, it's sort of a velvety looking uh, caterpillar that can grow to about an inch long. And there's a little bit of a blow up of it down below of a smaller version of it. So you can see what it looks like. Easy to hand pick. 
if you're very squeamish about touching insects, you can have a, uh, a container, a plastic container of water with a tiny, just a drop of detergent in it to break the, the uh, surface tension of the water. And then you go to the plant and you bang on the leaves with the water held underneath and this insect will fall off into the water. Uh, but really they're not bad to hand pick. And I, I guarantee you that after a, uh, fussing with a container of water for a while, you will be happy to learn how to do it with your fingers. But knocking them off is, hand picking is certainly a viable way of keeping them from damage or damaging your plants. If you do not control them some way, they will strip your plants. They are voracious and um, you know, they, they will be there. Uh, another thing to know is that our gardens are full of insects that are helpful rather than harmful. Insects that eat these eggs, insects that eat the tiniest caterpillars. Um, so uh, you can encourage those kinds of insects to visit your garden by growing flowers in your garden. Flowers that have um, visible pollen structures and open nectar uh, areas, uh, things and lots of them, like alyssum. Sweet alyssum with all its tiny, tiny little white flowers is an excellent attractor for beneficial insects that actually prey on or parasitize these kinds of pest insects. That is the subject for another class, one of my favorite subjects to, to teach people about. I hope sometime I'll meet you in a class where I'm talking about those beneficial insects. There is another way to deal with these particular pests. Any caterpillar uh, can be uh, dispatched with one of two uh, pesticides, both of which are approved for organic farming and gardening. Uh, not that you have to be approved for organic gardening, but organic farmers can use both these products. Uh, the one on the left is Bacillus thuringiensis. It is a bacteria that is fatal to caterpillars. It, it is a ground dwelling bacteria. It was discovered in 1911 and it has been in use as a pesticide since the 1950s. It only kills caterpillars, only caterpillars. But it does kill caterpillars that you might enjoy having in your garden like the butterfly caterpillars. So you would only want to, to use this product and you would have to, again, as I said, with pesticides, absolutely follow the instructions to the letter. It is not going to be toxic to you, but that doesn't mean you wanna get it on yourself. Um, but you would use this uh, only on the coal crops, the cabbage family crops that these caterpillars are threatening you would not use it all over the garden because if you put it on plants that other um, uh, uh, butterflies visited, they could also be killed by it. Um, I'm not going to go into all the features of it, but just know that it exists. It's called BT for short, uh, and uh, you can find it in any garden center and be sure and follow the instructions. And the other one that I've got here is Spinosad, um, this is um, also a, the product of a, um, um, I think it's a fungus. It's a, um, the active ingredient in spinosad is, well, it's spinosad is the active ingredient and the, it is a uh, ingredient produced by soil fungi. So same thing, it's already a part of our, um, of our ecosystem. And it turns out that it is toxic to caterpillars, thrips and flies. So uh, it is a, another good pesticide to use if you, if you um, can't get this uh, caterpillar pests under control by hand picking or block them out of your garden. Okay, now I know a lot of you had questions about leaf miner. And uh, this is a picture of, on the upper left, uh, the start of the damage by leaf miner and down below the damage as it progresses. And anybody who grows chard or spinach or beets has probably seen this uh, on, their, on their vegetables. 
at some time of year. This insect is not active uh, throughout the season, but it is active early in the season and again in the spring. And it stays active quite a while in the spring. If you grow chard year round, you're, you'll have it for a few months in the spring and we'll have it for at least a month or six weeks, maybe eight weeks here in the fall as well. It is a small fly, small as a fruit fly. So you won't see the actual insect uh, adult, but it lays its egg on the back of the leaf of your plant, on the underside of the leaf again. And the, when it hatches, the larva immediately tunnels into the leaf and then it crawls around eating the material between the top and lower surfaces of the leaf. So that's why you get those blistery looking messy splotches. The larva is in there somewhere. And if you look at a splotch like that, uh, maybe not so much in this kind of area where it's already browned out, but down here where it's still fresher, you will probably see the larva in there. And the larva is big enough to see. The larva is almost, can be up to like a third of an inch uh, long. So, and it looks like a little worm. It's a maggot because it's a fly that is doing this. Um, so, and then once that larva, that maggot is big enough, it will pupate either in the leaf or outside of the leaf and then come out again as a fly and start the cycle again on another leaf of your chart. So the way to deal with this, it's impossible to spray or do anything about it once it's inside the leaf. So you want to, um, either get rid of the eggs. Now, here's another, turn over the leaf, every leaf of chard and look for the eggs. I know you that sounds impossible, but I do it. Uh, and they are bright white. And because the plants that this attacks, chard, spinach, beets, have such dark green leaves, those eggs stand out like crazy on the underside of that leaf. You cannot miss them. So you will see them lined up, they're little, um, like grains of rice, but much, much tinier, uh, lined up side by side by side in a cluster on the, on the bottom of the leaf. And there may be more than one cluster. So you go out with a cup of tea, you sit down beside your charred plants and you turn those leaves over and you rub off those eggs. Um, if you have not rubbed them off on time, if the uh, larva has gotten into the leaf already, your only choice when you see this kind of damage is to remove that leaf and get rid of it. Sometimes if it's just a tiny patch, I have torn it off and uh, just gotten rid of that part and kept the bulk of the leaf or taken the leaf in and used it and just cut out the bad part. Um, do not put these leaves, damaged leaves into your compost pile because the lar if the larva is still in there, it can finish its life cycle and come out. So uh, you want to either put them down the garbage disposal or put them in a plastic bag and put them in uh, the garbage. Yeah, if you put them in your composter and it's four days before uh, it's picked up uh, by the city, they could finish their cycle in there as well. So better to get rid of that leaf right away. So that's leaf miner. And then aphids are the other big one. And we did have a question from, uh, we had a comment from one participant who said that Aphids were the reason that she didn't do a cool season garden. And uh, that is very sad, but it's understandable. They are incredibly frustrating. They come in, there are many, many different species. They come in a lot of different colors. Here we have two that are very common on cool season crops. On the left, you see the black bean aphid, um, sadly on chard, but uh, it's nevertheless, it's the black bean aphid. And on the right, you see the cabbage aphid appropriately on cabbage, but it will get on kale, collards, anything in that cabbage family. Um, so these are just two. They, the one on the left shows you very nicely how aphids tend to curl up the leaves uh, of the plants that they're sucking on. They're sucking insects. And uh, so they curl up the leaves to protect themselves. If you see curly leaves on chard, uh, uncurl it and you'll probably find aphids in there. Um, and they will, one or two people think, where do they all come from? <laughs> and why do they keep coming? Well, uh, a one or two or three or four um, female aphids with wings 
fly into your garden when you put out the plants they want. And they have been hanging out somewhere near your garden waiting for you to do that. Probably on weeds that uh, may not, that, that you might think are innocuous, like sow thistle is a favorite one for the black bean aphid. And when, once there's chard in the air, all plants put out chemical signals that say, I'm here. They put out some other very complicated signals too, but they say, I'm here. And the aphids sense that and they head for the chard. Just as I said, one or two or three or four female winged aphids. Female aphids give live birth uh, without benefit of any male assistance. So they sit on your chart and they start making this aphid colony. So how do you prevent this? Well, you can cover it with row cover. Definitely they're way too small to be kept out by any kind of, of uh, uh, screening you might use, hardware cloth, and et cetera. Um, but you could cover it with row cover. The danger of that is that you have to be sure there are no aphids in there on the plants before you cover it, or what you have done is protected the aphids from their predators. And I will tell you, aphids have more predator, insect predators than any other insect. Everything eats aphids. Um, so um, I did row cover one time and lived to regret it. So I'm speaking from experience. Um, you can, when there's, you can check your plants every day or two and rub off those developing colonies with your fingers. Um, if there are a lot of them, you can wash them off with water. Uh, you may do a little bit of damage to the leaves of your plants with a hard stream of water, but um, it may be worth it to get the aphids off. They are highly unlikely to be able to crawl back up. They're too soft bodied uh, to crawl out of a puddle of water and get up. So um, you, washing them off with water is good. If a leaf is really, really badly infested and you can't imagine being able to wash it off, you may wanna just take that leaf off the plant. That's another way to do it. It takes vigilance and persistence. They are only active for a few weeks and then it gets too cold for them. So you can take uh, pleasure or uh, comfort in the idea that it won't take too long before it's too cold for them. But if you can try to stay on top of them during their days, and again, um, encourage natural parasites and predators by having those flowers in your garden. Herb flowers, cilantro flowers are terrific for this, parsley flowers, thyme flowers, mustard flowers. Um, and I mentioned the lysum before, and that's also a really, really good one. Okay. Um, here's the floating row cover. I already mentioned that, that if you use that for this purpose, uh, you could be trapping, uh, you could be keeping out the predators and keeping protecting the aphids. So um, I, I can't bring myself to recommend this, but if you're sure that your plants are clean, if you put it on, the day you plant them and you check them when you plant them, uh, you could try growing your plants under row cover to keep the aphids off. Okay, that's it for pests. Oh, we had this, uh, a question about this. So let me mention this. Um, these insects on the left are called white grubs collectively. It's a generic term. Uh, it is not a name of an insect. It's a generic term for this kind of beetle larva. It, the the um, different sizes you see here are because there are different white grubs here. There are different uh, beetles that these came from, but it was a, just a general uh, picture that I wanted to show you. So they're about an inch long. They have a tan head. They have six legs. They curl into a C when you find them. And they have that capsule at the end of their body that is dark in color. That's their fecal material that hasn't been expelled yet and they live in the soil. So when you find them is when you're digging your, your vegetable beds. Um, and if you have a lot of them in your vegetable beds, it's because you have a very, very light, high organic matter soil. So this means that you may not have to add compost for a while because if, you're, if your bed is high enough in organic matter to attract these guys, then you probably have more than enough compost in there already. 
they're very commonly found in raised beds that have been filled with um, a, a soil mix designed for raised beds. They are, the ones that we find here most often are the bigger ones in this picture. And they are the larva of the beetle, uh, yeah, the beetle that you see on the left, which is the one that you find sometimes banging around your lights in May or June. We call it a June beetle, colloquially. It is the masked chafer. It's a very common pest here. It does not eat your plants. It only lives this beetle for a month. It lives, it comes out of the ground where it was living as, as, a, as a pupa like this. I, I'm sorry, as a larva like this, which then pupated. And when it finished pupation, it comes out as this beetle. This beetle flies around, finds a mate, bothers you by being attracted to your lights in the evening in May, June. And then uh, the females go back, lay their eggs in the soil, and they all and all the adults die. They don't even eat during this month. So they're not a plant pest. But these guys, uh, the preferred place for these to live is in your turf. So they are a serious turf pest. They eat the, the thatch and the roots of your turf. Uh, so this is what causes raccoons and skunks to dig up your lawn. They want these uh, insects to eat and not, they don't care about your, your turf. They, they want the insects. So um, that, is, um, that is white grubs. They are not a pest of the vegetable garden. Even though you might find them in your beds, they are not going to hurt your vegetable uh, plants. When you're digging your bed or loosening your soil, getting ready for the next season. By the way, these guys come out when you find them, it's always in the spring, in the late spring, when uh, they're done pupating and they're, get, they're, they're gonna pupate and then they're gonna get ready to come out as these beetles. So, um, when you find them, just throw them out of your bed uh, into a, something that they can't crawl out of and birds will come and eat them. They will love that you're doing that. I've had blue jays come right up to my, I could touch them because I would put white grubs on the driveway and the blue jays would come and get them. So somebody will come and pick them up if you do that, but, or you can squash them if you, if you uh, don't wanna take a chance. So not, a vegetable garden pest, not to worry. Okay, that's it on pests. And I think that we are way behind. <laughs> so um, I'm afraid rather than taking questions on pests right now, uh, I'm gonna just plow on here. Um, unless I hear something else from my, from my buddies. Uh, no, Candace, that Sharon, I think that sounds like a great idea. Okay, I did. We've got lots of people with lots of problems. We need to do another class. <laughs> okay, all right, we'll do that. Maybe we should just have a question and answer session as a follow up uh, to this to this three parter. Uh, we'll we'll talk about that. Watch the website for announcements uh, of new classes. Okay, I did want to give you a few harvesting tips that just in case experienced gardeners would already know these things, I'll try to go through them really quickly. Uh, lettuce uh, can be harvested, many of our vegetables, winter vegetables can be harvested leaf by leaf. So even if it's a head lettuce, you can harvest the outer leaves, the outermost leaves, leaf by leaf. Just get down there close to the plant and break the leaf off, don't cut break it off close to the plant, like you're actually kind of ripping it off the plant down there. If you pick regularly like this, you will always be eating the youngest, sweetest parts of the plant. If you let a plant grow until it's huge, the leaves, the lower leaves are gonna be quite old by that time. So you always wanna find ways to eat, pick leaf by leaf so that you're getting, um, you're getting uh, the youngest and sweetest things. And pick regularly. Uh, you can pick things down to six or seven leaves and they will keep growing. So this lettuce would, you could pick enough from this plant to make a small salad for a family uh, without damaging the plant at all. Uh, the same is true for kale and, and it's really a necessity for kale to keep the plant growing vigorously. So you pull, you grab it down here right by the stalk 
and you just give it a little twist and downward tug and it will tear right off. You can see the leaf scars from other leaves that have been taken off. And then over in this other picture, you can see what happens. The stem just gets uh, naked and it just keeps growing up. And you'll, you're, 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 you will be constantly harvesting fresh young kale and leaving about five or six leaves up there at the top uh, to continue to grow. The next week, you'll have that many leaves to pick again. So you always wanna leave the, the uh, a circle of them at the top to keep growing, but you can, you can just harvest so much more kale or collards or chard this way. Chard should also be harvested this way. In the case of chard, the leaves are attached at the bottom. So you're gonna grab it again at the very bottom of the leaf and just twist it and twist it right off the plant. That way you don't leave a stub. If you cut these things, you leave a stub on the stem. If that stub starts to rot, that's, there's the potential for that rot extending into the stem and you could lose your plant. So tear it off, don't cut it off. Um, root vegetables, we ta already talked about the fact that you could pick some of the greens from these, never more than about oh, three or four leaves maybe when you have this many leaves around, uh, you know, not more than a third of the leaves at a time. But I put this picture in here to talk about how you actually harvest the root vegetable themselves. Because turnips and, and uh, rutabagas and beets grow out of the ground, it's actually very easy to pull them out of the ground. So you just grab the whole bunch of leaves and gently uh, exert pressure on it and it will come right out of the ground. If it doesn't, you can always pry it out with a trowel, but generally these are easy to pull out. Um, that is not true for some of the other root vegetables like carrots, mm. parsnips, or for some of the alliums like leeks. Um, if you pull too hard on the foliage of a carrot or a parsnip or a leek, it's likely to break off in your hand or the vegetable to break off halfway down into the dirt. So with those, you do wanna help them out. When you're harvesting, um, do um, uh, lift it out with a digging fork or a trowel or something like that. It, it, it's not hard to do because the soil is loose, but just help it out rather than just pulling on, the, on it hard. And then in terms of broccoli and cauliflower, this is, this is the tip here, do not let this happen. You, you know that broccoli and cauliflower, the heads that we eat are actually a tight cluster of unopened flower buds. And you can see in the picture on the right that that's really true. Every one of those little teeny buds, it would open up into a yellow flower, uh, typical of this family, if you uh, let it go. You don't want that head, that central head, which is the only thing you're gonna get in cauliflower. You do not want that to start to spread open at all. You want to harvest it when it is really tight. Don't have a preconceived idea of how big it should get. That's going to depend on the spacing, on the nutrition in the, on, in the soil, on the watering, on the food, etc. So watch them, get to know them, and when it stops enlarging, cut it. It may not be anything like the ones that you're used to seeing in the grocery store. Uh, and of course, the one on the right here is too far gone. Now you might say, but is it still edible? Well, yes, it is. But when the plant starts to do this, it's getting ready to make flowers. And we all know that means getting ready to make seeds. And so it's going to start shifting nutrients in the plant. And this is not going to be as tasty and sweet and mild as uh, what you would have gotten if you picked it when it was at its prime. If you pick the central head of broccoli, uh, you get much more broccoli coming from the side shoots. And the total harvest is gonna be more from these side shoots than it ever would be from that central head. So there's no, no harm, no foul in picking the central head of the broccoli. This will not happen with cauliflower though. So as these small shoots form all over the plant in every leaf axle, you'll be harvesting those and you will have many, many more meals from your broccoli plant uh, from that. Okay, just a quick thing on frost because I don't know how many of you live uh, south of San Jose, 
Uh, those of us that live north of San Jose and in the central part of the county do not have hard frost. So a hard frost is, this is charred with frost on it, but a hard frost is defined as less than 28 degrees for more than four hours. And I know that there are parts of our county and we therefore we may have uh, listeners who do live where they get hard frosts all the time. So I wanted to put up a quick list and I would like you, um, you all to um, copy this down quickly if you uh, see something on here that matters to you. If you live up here, we, we just don't get hard frosts lower than 28 unless it's a, a freak year. Now saying that in the middle of this incredibly freaky year is uh, probably dangerous, but uh, let's hope we don't have a, a hard frost this winter. Um, but there are some vegetables that should be protected in a hard frost and there are a few that do not need to be protected and you see them listed here. Hopefully you're taking notes uh, quickly now on this. Um, but you can just throw a heavier row cover. It's nice to have a little row cover in your garden shed that is heavier. When you buy row cover from a garden supply uh, place, it will tell you how many degrees of frost protection it will give you. So you can buy row cover that gives two degrees of frost protection, four degrees of frost protection, et cetera. So you might wanna have one that gives you say four uh, degrees or six degrees of frost protection. And that will be more than ample for most of the county. But for those of you down near Morgan Hill and Gilroy uh, in, a, in open areas, uh, you may need to uh, really work at frost protection. I, I do understand that. Okay, we're going to talk about cover crops just quickly because if you have any bare area in your garden, it would be terrible not to have a cover crop on it. Um, I think we will skip the poll, Sharon, on yes, agreed. cover crops and just talk a little bit about it. So uh, I'm sure that some of you have grown them and congratulations if you have done that. If you have any part of your garden uh, this winter that you do not plan to, to plant uh, vegetables, you should plan to plant it in a cover crop, which is anything that you grow not to harvest, but just to do something good for your soil. Uh, the kinds of good things that cover crops do for the soil are they protect your soil from blasting heat, from driving rain, uh, from frost. Um, they uh, protect it, they, they will draw water out of waterlogged soil so that it won't become anaerobic, that is, it will enable the soil to continue have air in some of its pores uh, so that the microorganisms uh, in the soil can continue to thrive. Um, so it's, it's a wonderful thing to cover the soil with. When we have our very wet winters and cold wind and some cold uh, days, it's uh, perfect for, for covering uh, the soil. So what do we use for this? Uh, oh, and then just to, for the, what most of us use it for, is there another major reason for having a cover crop is if you want it to be a green manure. That is, if you want to grow, you can grow a cover crop that actually has the capability of fixing nitrogen from the air in the soil to make it into plant available nitrogen. If you grow this kind of a cover crop, and we'll talk about what they are, any legume, if you grow this kind of a cover crop and chop it into your soil the right way, you will not have to fertilize the next season. You will get plenty of nitrogen from the cover crop. So this is happens through the magic of certain kinds of bacteria that live on the roots of legumes. So any bean or pea or clover or vetch, these plants are all legumes they live in a symbiotic relationship with, with certain kinds of bacteria that live in nodules on the roots and these little white pinkish, pinkish white uh, structures that you see on the roots of this uprooted fava bean are those nodules. The bacteria live in there. They are able to fix 
nitrogen from air and convert it into plant available forms. And then they give that nitrogen to the plant in exchange for sugars that the plant gives to the bacteria. So it's a symbiotic relationship. So the nitrogen goes into the plant, the plant uses it in its stems and leaves and flowers and beans or peas. But when we grow it as a cover crop, we cut it down at a particular time. We cut it down when it's about half in bloom because we want to cut it down when the nitrogen is at its peak in the plant. And that for fava beans is when it's about half in bloom. For every uh, legume that you might use, and here is a list of the nitrogen fixing legumes on the left. Uh, these are available from garden supplies on the web in, in bulk. So you can buy all of these uh, easily by just Googling these names. Um, the, the, uh, each one has its uh, particular time of being cut down and you, you are going to cut it down, uproot it and chop it up and cover and turn it into the soil. It's a, it's a process. <laughs> it's, it, it's, a, uh, it's a job. But uh, your reward is that it will, the, the plant material will rot into the soil. Uh, the nitrogen will be um, eventually released into the soil through the processes of decomposition of this material in the soil. And it's not a, um, it's not a perfect process. This is a picture of a cover crop that's been cut in. And you can see there's a lot of it lying on the surface. You wanna get it covered as well as you can. Um, but it's going to be messy. And we will show you how to do this in the spring at our demonstration gardens. So come to the Palo Alto demonstration garden, watch the website for the announcement, and we will show you how to turn in cover crop. So plant your cover crop if you want to do this. The organic material from, the, from that cover crop is wonderful for your soil, and you get this bonus of nitrogen. Now, if you don't use a legume, these are other materials that are used for cover crops. And someone asked about cover crops for preparing for growing tomatoes. Well, any of these will prepare you in terms of putting nitrogen into the soil and organic uh, material for your tomatoes. But there is some evidence and it's being studied very carefully right now that the residue from broccoli plants, and I'm talking a field of broccoli, not one or two plants, but the whole bed put into broccoli, and then you can harvest the head and then chop in the residue, or certain kinds of mustards that they may suppress verticillium wilt. Um, we will talk about that uh, more in, in other classes. I'm sorry, we don't have time to go into the details, but you might wanna look that up on the web um, or ask the help desk about it uh, if you want more details on how to do that, if you want to see if you can use that to suppress verticillium wilt. Okay, last but far from least is that um, we were gonna talk about how to extend the season. And one way you can extend the season is to look at the planting um, chart that's on our website and check out everything that can be planted into October. And there are a couple of things that might go into even November. Uh, so you could have seedlings ready to go to replace your lettuce that you have harvested the whole head by October or November. You can probably put that in. You might be able to even put in if you've exhausted your turnips or something like that, you may be able to get those in. So check the, the list and have some seedlings ready to go. Asian vegetables, spinach, these are things that can be planted quite late. The other thing is don't, whatever you do, miss the second season, which is planting in February and March. Every single thing that we've talked about planting can be planted again in February and March. You, you, if you again, uh, consult the chart on the website, consult the individual uh, vegetables and see what it is you want to put again in again in February and March. Um, because you have, if you start at the 1st of March, you have March, April, and May that these plants can grow and produce for you. Three full months. And during that time, the weather is getting warmer. The days are getting longer. 
And uh, that means that they will grow super fast during that time, instead of growing now when the days are getting shorter and the weather is getting cooler. So that is a fabulous season to grow cool season crops. And if you say, oh, but I usually put my tomatoes in by April, I'm going to say to you, if this keeps you from putting in your tomatoes too early, that's a good thing. <laughs> so let yourself eat kale and, and chard and collards and turnips and uh, peas and everything else uh, in February, March, April, and even into May and plant your summer vegetables at the end of May. And they will be happier and they will still do extremely well for you. Um, okay, I, uh, that was a race to the finish. Here's just a reminder uh, about our website and the, the information that's on it. And uh, there's a picture of part of the chart uh, just to emphasize, look at all those yellow squares uh, in February and March where you can plant all these things again. Um, so I hope that this has been a, um, a helpful uh, session for you. I did wanna get over these things and still have time. I hope you will stay with us for just a few minutes longer to give us some feedback on how this series worked for you. This is the first time we've done this three-part series, uh, especially it's the first time we've done any series like this on Zoom. Uh, so we have a few final uh, questions, not that one, that was the pest uh, poll. Uh, we want, yeah, uh, this one. So you will, if you, uh, scroll down on this poll, you will see there are five questions. If you would please answer these questions for us, it would be extremely helpful uh, in uh, determining how effective uh, we've been. And do scroll down to go all the way uh, to the end of the poll. Candace, are we asking for the three sessions if they attended online or if they actually, watched it? Actually, it, it doesn't matter. Thank you for asking that, Edith. That's a good point. We actually want to know if you saw them. So it, 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 were you uh, live with us on Zoom or did you view them? If you viewed them, um, you can also say that you attended all three. Candice, there's some really lovely comments coming in on the. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, this has been, this has been a really, yeah, yeah, this has been a really interesting experience for me because not being able to see you and see how you are responding to uh, the information as it comes at you, especially this last class where we just bulldoze through here at the end. Um, but, and, and to not be able to take all your questions in person and, and find out what was behind the questions, uh, that's been very different for me. But it's been thrilling to have so many of you come back for all three sessions and, um, and, and the feedback is, it, it looks great. Um, and we're getting a lot of good, um, interesting feedback on what we can do next for you as well. So uh, trust me, we will be doing more classes. Uh, again, I wish I could see you. I hope you will come to the Palo Alto Demonstration Garden while we're, while we're uh, still having to do everything on Zoom. We do have an open house this weekend, this Saturday from 10 to 12, and Sharon and I will be there again. And uh, we would love to see some of you out there. Hopefully the uh, air quality will be um, better than it is right now. For that um, but I would love to meet you please tell me that you attended the class online if you did and uh, you can ask all the questions you want. Edith how is the poll going? 
Maybe we'll make some, give people another minute. Yeah, let's give them uh, a few more seconds and I'll take some screenshots and I think we'll be done. Meanwhile, this is Sharon again. So we hope you've been able to use the information we gave you. So you've actually been able to plant some winter vegetables. Again, we're really sorry we haven't been able to get to all of your questions. I wanted to thank Candace again for her terrific presentation. We want to thank the Palo Alto Library for co-sponsoring the event and to all of you for attending and for all your questions. Um, take care and happy gardening. Thank you, everybody.